Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. And again, good morning, everyone. Um, we changed tech a little bit here. Um, Baylor has given us an excellent um, introduction and lecture about um, uh, modeling. Uh, this one is a real overview talk. Uh, and also, uh, by the way, forgive me, um, there is a bit of uh, Australian, uh, Australian focus here in this one, uh, but I think you will forgive me for that. Uh, it's not just the cover slide. Um, now, given that it's an overview talk, I think I have to make a few comments um, so that we are all on the same page. It is really an introduction, so unlike, for example, Baylor's talk, I will not go and will not have the time uh, to go any particular details. Um, in terms of details, uh, as we just heard, you know, I would have to really refer you to the, to the specialist talks uh, and to my colleagues, lecturers. I apologize if I am a bit um, superficial here and, and basically uh, not go into any detail of your particular area. But I think from the student's perspective, it is important to get um, a grasp at least of the overarching nature of the different areas uh, we are tackling in uh, ocean forecasting, operational oceanography. Uh, as a result of it, a certain overlap with other lectures is intended and, in fact, unavoidable. Um, so, the other point, the last point there, uh, it's really about systems. It's, it's not just the modeling, it's not just the observations. Uh, as many of you will know, um, operational ocean, oceanography or forecasting uh, includes a lot of components, and that's, in an overarching sense, really the focus of my uh, two lectures. Um, and I can actually move away from the light somewhat because it's really hot there. <laughs> I have to find the best position, Bella. Where is it? Here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so quickly running through the, through the lectures uh, this morning, um, I'll try to give you uh, or provide you with an explanation of what ocean, operational oceanography is. Uh, I give you a very brief um, history of um, oceanography, which or operational oceanography, which of course is linked to the history of oceanography as a whole. Uh, and then I'll start what I think is the key uh, element of, um, of this lecture, uh, or the key elements, uh, which are really uh, what are the components of an operational oceanography system, uh, observations, models, data assimilation most importantly, uh, now cast and hind cast as, as basically uh, uh, in quotes products or what one can do with these kind of systems. And then I'll briefly summarize um, the uh, lecture. Um, and we then continue later this afternoon uh, with uh, some examples about forecasting systems and uh, products and services, uh, which then leads automatically into the applications and benefits of uh, ocean forecasting systems or operational oceanography. Um, uh, section 8 is basically about uh, Good Day Ocean View. Um, so I'll talk in a little bit more detail than I did this morning um, about uh, what, it, what Good Day Ocean View is all about. But then um, I will also make a few comments about the trends and future developments and requirements and challenges and the challenges you eventually will have to tackle once you get into operational oceanography uh, and uh, will hopefully then improve the systems. And then I conclude the lecture uh, with a summary as well, a brief summary. So I hope it makes sense. I still have to get used to this pointer here. Um, now, let's start. Um, there are lots of people and lots of names uh, I have to acknowledge and I have to thank. And there are probably uh, some people not on this list who should be on this list uh, because I've drawn on quite a few bits of information, other people's slides, etc., etc. So if you feel um, insulted uh, as a lecturer because I didn't include your slide or because I included your slide and didn't acknowledge you, uh, please tell me afterwards and I'm more than happy to add your name. No bad feelings intended. Um, now, what is operational oceanography? First of all, there is no widely accepted and unanimously accepted definition uh, about operational oceanography. There is a working definition provided by uh, the European component of the Global Ocean Observing System, and you can read it for yourself. It says that operational oceanography can be defined as the activity of systematic and long-term routine measurements of the seas and oceans and atmosphere and their rapid interpretation and dissemination. Personally, I think that covers part of the story, but not everything, because it emphasizes the observations and their dissemination, but it doesn't talk about, for instance, forecasting. So, let's have a closer look then. Well, what is, at least in my understanding, uh, what is operational oceanography? It's obviously like weather forecasting uh, for the ocean. It provides estimates of ocean variables like temperatures and currents for the past, present, and the future. 
but it's also based uh, on a systematic, systematic focus on sustained operational, such as quality control and robustness, ocean observing, short-range prediction and reanalysis. So that's very important. This is not a one-off effort, but if you really want to do operational oceanography, you have to put in place certain measures to quality control. But then following that, it's also about routine, fully supported production and delivery of services. Because, you know, if you do forecasting without anyone else caring about it, you do excellent science, no question about it, but that's just part of the story. You want to have uptake of your products by end users. Uh, it's the famous uh, societal impact. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the focus, it covers basically the global to coastal, and Baylor would probably say even higher scales, <laughs> finer scales, um, marine environments and uh, physical and biogeochemical properties. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about biogeochemical and uh, ecosystems later on, but I think it's fair to say up front um, that they are less, much less mature um, than the, the physical components of o operational oceanography. And as I said already, uh, it's the uh, a whole spectrum of uh, groups and stakeholders involved, from marine industry, service providers, government agencies, and research agencies, uh, like many of you, uh, representing many of you. So that's basically, in, in my view, at least a broad description of what uh, oceanography is. But again, there is no unanimously agreed um, definition. Um, this is the very, very famous picture <laughs> and uh, a slightly different version of what we saw earlier uh, today um, of uh, Dudley Shelton's uh, famous um, scales, spatial and temporal scales. But I think it's always um, a nice thing to remind ourselves um, at the very top end, at the very top, oops, um, at the very top end, you have uh, the um, the climate change time scale, and then basically um, you can see clearly that the eddy resolving scales uh, have to um, have to uh, basically much higher resolution and and also much higher temporal resolution uh, as we go down the scales, and I think um, what. Um, what Baylor originally discussed, some of the molecular processes here, uh, is well beyond the scope, at least, of current, uh, current forecasting systems. Um, so, with that in mind, let me give you a very brief summary of, um, in quotes, operational, uh, unquote, oceanography. And again, I just want to emphasize it's about uh, the physical parts of it, and I don't read out the individual components. Uh, it's about, to some extent, and increasingly, in fact, uh, the biogeochemical oceanography, like the chemical cycles uh, that uh, drive or have an impact, uh, biological activity, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, the nutrient cycles, in other words. Uh, but it's also about um, the focus and briefly focusing on uh, the basics uh, of today's systems, which are the, mod the observing system and the numerical modeling, plus, which I should have added here, uh, the data simulation, which really brings together the observ observations and the models. Um, so, Again, I won't go into the details, uh, and we've seen some of the names on the previous slides from uh, Baylor, but um, I mean, apart from, from various, um, how should I say, early uh, research cruises, like the Challenger cruise in 1872, which was the first oceanographic cruise um, uh, undertaken by the British, which had a dedicated focus on, on oceanography, on, on, on basically wa sampling the water column, but what also happened in those days, uh, in the 1900s to the mid-20th century, were some kind of key publications from Coriolis, Ekman, Sverdrup, and that one, in fact, was a key publication. Uh, and then also, like, the uh, development of autisticity theories and theorems um, as an extension to Newton's law. So these are just examples, and even less complete uh, than the one we saw previously, but they basically provided the mathematical framework uh, for the development of numerical models. Uh, an interesting event was actually, or happened in the um, early 1970s, which was the first large-scale field experiment uh, in oceanography with a clear focus on mesoscale observing, uh, uh, mesoscale eddy motions in uh, the dynamics of ocean circulation. So in terms of where we are today in oceanography, that was a first uh, critical experiment because it, was, it, it focused really the attention on eddies. But then, of course, also we had uh, the development of the Tau Triton array in the Pacific, uh, which uh, allowed us to monitor and ultimately predict uh, El Nino events. Also, led, this led then to the first uh, successful uh, answer prediction by Zbiek and Kane in 1987. 
Um, and another example, which some of you might have heard, um, it was really the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, uh, which was aimed uh, at establishing the role of the world ocean in the Earth's climate system. So uh, it really uh, focused, and I've got a slide here, on many, many uh, cruise, cruises, sections, um, and that was undertaken over a period of eight years, followed by a synthesis uh, period. But I think the interesting fact here is that um, for the deep ocean, I mean, you can assume that there's a quasi-stationarity over a certain period of time, probably not even the eight years. But certainly if you look at the surface, uh, and we've seen this at the previous um, pr um, lecture, there's so much change that basically uh, any kind of model or data simulation system which tries to um, synthesize these observations and to get consistency uh, with the, of the model with the observations would probably struggle. Uh, I think that's uh, something uh, which was sort of a, a lesson learned from both. Um, moving on, and, but that was by, in the 90s, by the way, that was state of the art. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, there, was, there was no Argo. Now, another example here, um, then I think hailed as a, as a breakthrough in modeling. I'm not sure if that's correct. Uh, but I remember, in fact, having been at a, um, at a workshop uh, where um, Sempner, uh, basically, or Chervin presented it, and everybody dropped the jaw and said, wow, that looks great. Uh, and that was in the, in the early 90s. Um, and nobody else had ever seen this, at least not in a model, uh, which of course is one of the uh, first, uh, edu well, permitting um, uh, simulations in a, on a global scale. So keep in mind what Bela said earlier in terms of resolution. Here we talk about a half a degree uh, global model, 20 vertical levels. We're all laughing about this today uh, in terms of the computing power, but that was state of the art in the, in the early 90s. Um, I should also mention that um, first, uh, even coarser, however, uh, ocean atmosphere coupled models were used in the early 90s for the first uh, IPCC assessment report. Um, now, talking about the 90s, just a reminder, uh, the 90s, it's just, uh, well, 20, 30 years ago, um, we still, people still had to manually almost uh, draw maps. We are now at a very advanced stage, not just in terms of computing power, but we have tools at our hands, and you probably wouldn't even know this, uh, but you know, you, can you imagine uh, 20, 30 years would have to draw the maps by hand? Uh, so just keep that in mind. It's a, another huge development and step forward that uh, we have many, many an analysis tools, electronic analysis tools in these days, which assist us in interpreting uh, observations or model data output or whatsoever. Um, and um, I have to show this slide. Uh, where are you, Jacques? <laughs> oh, that's a pity, uh, because they actually, uh, I have to say this, uh, France was among the first countries um, to basically realize that the mid-90s were a major breakthrough, uh, breakthrough for the major breakthrough. Uh, on the one hand, I showed you the modeling and the supercomputing capacity rapidly increasing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, first satellites coming on board and therefore enabling, uh, together with enhanced in-situ observation, um, ocean forecasting. So these guys here and the ladies uh, I, uh, basically came together in 95 and um, realized that potential. And um, Jacques Rouron to the right and um, Pierre Flatrion, you will meet uh, later this week, uh, were among those. I think they are the only two uh, of this group who will uh, participate in this uh, summer school. But we're, they were among the first in, in, in France and perhaps even globally um, to realize this potential and to initiate um, ocean forecasting, essentially. So prior to, to the mid-90s, there was nothing like ocean forecasting. So in other words, um, it's roughly 30 years behind or so, 40 years uh, behind numerical weather prediction. Okay. Um, just a very brief comment about Good Day, and I'm talking here specifically about Good Day, not Good Day Ocean View. That's the predecessor of Good Day Ocean View. And again, it relates to the uh, picture I just showed, because it's not just that uh, individual countries, individual agencies identified the potential, but there was also a realization that in order to make progress and um, to really demonstrate the potential and the feasibility of real-time operations of global oceanography, there was a real need to collaborate globally. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, for instance, uh, there was simply no capability initially uh, in, in, in global modeling and data assimilation, the scientific validation, and also basically how to ingest the observing uh, system and the data, and all these sort of things uh, were unknown and had to be developed. So what you're seeing today is a quite mature stage, despite all the challenges, 
uh, in terms of uh, operational oceanography. But these guys really started from scratch. And this program, basically, Goday, um, was uh, designed uh, to, sorry, to prove the, the, the feasibility of operational oceanography. And there are a few people like Eric. I think you were one of the few people in the room who are uh, who were the, also part of this in the first hours. Um, so um, you have got uh, great knowledge and history here in the room. Uh, I wasn't part of the first uh, meetings. Um, now, in terms of the achievements, uh, just to reflect briefly of Goday, um, initially, even, some of you might not know this, but Argo was actually a pilot project um, of uh, Goday, and um, I think uh, Cliva, was it Cliva, Eric? I forgot. Uh, another Cliva. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. Um, and then uh, also, of course, um, uh, GRIST, Global High Resolution SST product initially. So that was all spawned or co-spawned by uh, the Goodday team. Um, and then the other one, the other activity, which was really um, in its infancy in the early days, was the modeling, the edit permitting and resolving modeling, but also then, as I said, the, the key element here, the data simulation. So they needed to develop the capabilities, um, the implementation then of the data and product serving, and also uh, the eventual demonstration of the usefulness. I mean, just having a nice simulation is interesting from a scientific perspective, but you really have to aim to repeat or re replicate uh, reality and to forecast reality in the end. Okay, um, so that's good day. I come back later this afternoon on ter in terms of what Good Day Ocean View is doing these uh, days, but this is just a little bit of history. Now, moving on um, to the next um, section, uh, components of operational oceanography systems. Um, first of all, I mean, and I apologize if many of you are aware of that already. Let me give you this very busy slide and show you this very busy slide. But again, it illustrates very nicely um, the, um, the, the, the components of an operational ocean forecasting system. So at the top, you've got elements of the observing system, and you will hear various uh, presentations about uh, the observing system. In the middle, you've got um, the, well, the, the operational centers, essentially, which run the models, ingest the data, and then at the bottom, you've got a var variety of um, users, let them be end users, intermediate users who add value uh, to the product. Um, so in essence, I mean, in a nutshell, the take-home message is an operational system consists of an observing system, a modeling system, it, which includes the data simulation. Uh, and then you have to run it operationally, and then obviously you have to have some kind of applications in mind. Um, this is an old slide from 2000, from the Good Day uh, strategic plan. Uh, nevertheless, to a large extent, it's still um, up to date, I would claim. And without going to the details here and, and, and all the um, um, relationships and dependencies, but in essence, you've got uh, the input sources, as I said, at the top, the green boxes um, in various forms, the measurement networks and the data assembly centers. Uh, then in the middle, you have what was previously called the Good Day Commons, uh, where you use data from the data servers uh, and basically assimilate the data and produce products. And that then leads to the uh, users, and, and including research users and end users. So still very valid uh, schematic. And then, of course, as we all know, uh, you get output of certain variables, like the ones on the left-hand side, and you serve uh, a variety of, of groups, and there are various programs uh, in Europe and elsewhere, and we come back to that later this afternoon, uh, which basically uh, make this kind of uh, service delivery a key activity in these days. Okay, observations. Uh, again, as I said, I will be rather brief, uh, given that others will talk in much more detail about this. Um, but there are two key elements or key observations, uh, key observing data sets, which really enable um, ocean operational oceanography. Uh, the first one, of course, um, is the Institute Observing Network in its uh, various incarnations, let it be Argo floats, uh, XBTs, drifters, uh, you name it, HF radar on the coastal, along the coastal domains, uh, plus satellite, and uh, satellite altimetry is the leading one because it's the only one which actually resolves, uh, increasingly resolves, in fact, the um, uh, ocean mesoscale. I mean, you need the in-situ observations to supplement um, the altimetry because it's more or less surface-focused, but the in-situ observations alone wouldn't resolve uh, the mesoscale in the oceans. Um, and again, 
it's very important that um, you know these kind of um, systems have to be run ideally in an operational setting, although, um, and without going into the details here, unfortunately, uh, many are still being run um, through um, research funding, which is and can be an issue. Um, this slide here, in fact, is a very recent one, the, left, uh, the le upper left corner, and it shows a snapshot uh, over a month uh, for August 2017 of the individual uh, components of the global observing system. Uh, again, I won't go into the details. You might get the impression, well, that looks like a lot of data. But uh, if you would zoom in, and keeping in mind you know, the uh, scales, the MISO scales, um, and the limitations of individual data sets, you would still find um, that you know, it's not perfect. So uh, this picture, to some extent, gives you the wrong impression. It's good to have it, and it's necessary. Uh, but in terms of the in situ observations, we certainly could do better. Um, next one, um, and I got the slide from Perry Fulterill. Um, this is an update in pretty much, I think, state of the art where we are uh, with the altimetry missions. Um, and the vertical line shows you the current situation uh, where we are now. Um, there have been um, various or numerous um, simulations to uh, basically determine how many altimetry satellites we really need. Uh, I think the consensus among the, uh, the scientists is that typically between three and four of those altimetry satellites, in their current configuration at least, are needed to adequately resolve um, the uh, ocean meter scale on a, on a global scale. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. One satellite alone wouldn't do it. But then, of course, we also get um, in 2020 or something around 2020, uh, the, swat, the, the wide swath altimetry uh, satellite, which will also significantly increase the uh, amount of data. And again, I think a lot of um, uh, preliminary work is happening at the moment uh, at operational centers to prepare for this uh, step change really in, in the data we'll uh, get access to in the altimetry space. Um, models. Okay, so now close your eyes, Baylor. <laughs> um, because uh, luckily he gave you a much more elegant and uh, accurate, certainly, account of models. I just picked one example here. Um, and that is the, the primitive equation models, which are basically, um, well, uh, the, the background or the majority of models and uh, run in operational mode are based on the primitive equations. Um, I won't even go uh, through the details here because, as I said, Baylor covered that in much more detail uh, in terms of the, the balance equations for continu continuity, uh, conservation of momentum, uh, and thermal energy plus uh, salinity. Um, uh, from a, from a practical point of view, uh, from an operational oceanography perspective, uh, the key points are that you have uh, five essentially uh, prognostic variables plus the free sea surface height, if you want to add that, uh, which are really the, at the key focus of an operational forecasting system. So the three velocity uh, components, uh, the temperature, salinity, and the free sea surface height. Plus, as I said earlier, but I come back to that, potentially uh, biogeochemical variables. Um, and again, I'll skip this one here. Uh, I took this from Stephen Griffith's book, uh, but essentially just uh, writing out in uh, numerical terms, um, in mathematical terms, the equations. Um, and then basically, as we also heard, and this is just an example from, from our uh, domain, um, how we set up a whole system of models, um, basically addressing the global or quasi-global scale um, to the uh, regional scale, and also uh, we're operating and developing uh, really what um, we, de uh, what we uh, describe as a literal ocean modeling system, literal zone ocean modeling system, which is uh, basically, uh, and as we heard earlier, for, for predominantly for defense applications. Um, anyway, um, so data assimilation, and I thought I probably should spend a bit more time here. Um, on uh, data assimilation. Uh, I'm sure and I know that uh, there are lecturers who will again uh, specifically focus on it, but I just want to remind everyone that uh, data assimilation is, from my perspective again, uh, really at the center of and, and absolutely critical for ocean forecasting as it is for numerical weather prediction. And keep in mind, good day, global ocean data assimilation experiment really emphasized that in its early days. Without data assimilation, you can't correct the model normally. There are some exceptions, but normally, and therefore you will not get a useful forecast. So that's the reason why you need data assimilation. So um, what is data assimilation then? Well, the first definition is up there, and I picked it from some other slides, and I forgot 
who actually provided it, my apologies. Uh, model observation synthesis is a concept encompassing any method for combining uh, observations of variables like temperature or velocity components into numerical models like the ones used to predict climate or predict weather. Mm. Okay, that's one definition. <laughs> uh, another one, um, data simulation is a systematic use of estimation theory to derive the maximum information from sparse or noisy observations and incomplete or inaccurate dynamic models. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, Monarily, the purpose of data simulation is to estimate the state of the ocean using all information available, optimally combining observations with dynamics. Personally, I can live with a green box, so I think that's getting very close at least. Um, there has been, and I won't go into the details, uh, some debate uh, behind the scenes, um, and depending on your personal beliefs and preferences about ocean state estimation and data assimilation, um, I will use it here pretty much synonymously, although I know that there are others in the research community um, who would probably condemn me for that, for doing that. Uh, anyway, so what are, in general terms, applications of ocean data assimilation? Uh, estimation of ocean state in space and time, the four-dimensional reanalysis is one example. Then detection or control of model errors, um, such as associated with the turbulent mesoscale. Uh, another one, identification of model parameters, particularly with regard to biological models. Again, I come back to that later. Uh, and optimal design of observing systems. Um, it's very important that you know when you have the ability to assimilate data, to withhold uh, observations, you can actually um, assist the design of the observing systems. And I think there will be a lecture later on um, about this design next week, I think, uh, how to optimally design observing systems. Um, and then, of course, the most uh, common one is really the initialization of ocean predictions uh, similar to um, numer numerical weather prediction. Now, the, the most important point on this slide, perhaps, are the, is in red. There are two fundamental um, theories which actually uh, provide the rationale uh, for data simulation. One is based on optimal control theory uh, or variational, relates to variational data simulation and relates to maximum likelihood in these squares. The other one is optimal estimation, which is predominantly the basis for sequential data simulation, which relates to minimum variance and least squares. Um, I don't have the time uh, to really go into the details here, but I give you some ideas what it means. Now, um, first of all, sequential analysis, um, you have a forecast from a previous uh, time period, and then um, basically, um, and I need to use the pointer now here, for whatever reason, it doesn't work. Um, and um, you then basically uh, have a series of observations at, at different times, uh, you an do some kind of analysis, and then basically you initialize um, your model, which is basically a balanced um, um, analysis, or basically, a, uh, how should I say, it's a balance between the analysis based on observations and the model uh, uh, forecast from the previous round, and that gives you an initial condition for the next period, and then you repeat it uh, for as long as you can and want to run your um, forecast. Of course, you know, it implies that if you only have observations up to zero, you know, that's how far you, you can run the model much longer, but you wouldn't have observations. Um, so then there's the so-called background of first guess or prior, which is a forecast which is to be improved by data simulation. So this would be a prior here. This is where the tip of the arrow is. Uh, and as I just said, you get an analysis um, of the um, um, ocean, both from dynamics and observations. Okay, so... That's the sequential analysis, and here comes it a bit more complicated. It shows you also the error bars. If you have a forecast, usually or typically, uh, the model forecast error increases with time. Um, you then have uh, some observations at a point in time, which also is associated with some error, and then you do in the analysis, which gives you much, hopefully, much smaller analysis error and also an optimized um, initial um, state or initial condition for your next forecast. <coughs> um, in terms of 4D VAR um, algorithms, you basically have a, a certain period of time, or sorry, a certain set of observations over a period of time, which then constrain in a, in a way which I'll describe to you in a second, um, your, 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 your eventual, your initial condition. So it's not just at an instantaneous point in time, but you have a basically a whole period of time which constrains, constrains your model. Um, the difference in the case of a so-called reanalysis is that if you do a forecast, you only have uh, observations up to time t naught or t0. 
If you do a reanalysis, which of, is of interest for us, to many of us, because of the nice uh, science we can do, and because also it's a good test bed for any forecast, you actually have a, a, a time window which goes either side. You have uh, a time T0, basically. You also have the f uh, observations of the future, because you do, or well, future in quotes. Uh, but uh, because you go backwards in time, say in, say in 1995, you have observations from uh, December 1995 and January 1996. And if you do a reanalysis around that time, you have a, a window uh, around your time when you want to assimilate, which let's say is the 1st of January 1995, uh, 96. Now, OK. Um, I think that's probably all I should say about this slide. Um, in terms of the sequential me methods, there are three major ones, and I know that there are lots of subsets um, and different uh, versions of these. Uh, one is, and many of you will be aware of it, uh, optimal interpolation, including um, uh, ensemble optimal interpolation, which basically draws on an ensemble of model values to calculate the background uh, error covariance matrix, the famous Kalman filter and uh, the three-dimensional variational approach, which is basically um, uh, like 4D var, but it's only done at a particular t point in time rather than over a period of time. Um, now, I think um, this one here is an introduction to the um, um, optimal interpolation. Uh, the feature with optimal, key feature with optimal interpolation is it's steady. Uh, it's, it doesn't change in time. So the approach, as I've seen, as I've shown you on the previous slides, uh, with the Kalman filter um, or with uh, the um, adjoint or the variational method, is you have uh, you take into account uh, multiple time steps, uh, whereas here it's just a particular uh, analysis at a particular point in time. Um, that said, you can still get some useful results. This is an example from a, a quasi-geostrophic model. The colored uh, figures, uh, sorry, the colored uh, color show you the real field. Um, the um, the, the, the uh, ISO lines give you an, uh, an a the analyzed field uh, based on uh, optimal interpolation. The dotted points are the, the stream function observations, and the, um, the dots, full dots with an arrow are a few observations. Um, so that's basically a simulation of um, reality, uh, but what you can see here is that where you have observations, and that's a typical feature for data simulation, you can constrain the model, whatever model it is, typically much better than in areas where you have no observations, like here. You can see that the analyzed field looks quite different uh, to the real field in this corner because there are no observations up here. Um, moving to the Kalman filter, a sequential approach. And I don't want you to remember all the, um, basically, the notation here, because I'm sure someone else, uh, some, some other lecturer will uh, provide you with much more detailed explanation. But in essence, the key point here is um, that uh, there's a so-called um, Kalman gain, which is a whole set of um, metrics operations. It consists of the background field error, uh, basically the operator which projects um, the, the forecast, model forecast into observations, and the observing um, error covariance matrix. So that's this Ki. Uh, you then multiply that uh, with the uh, forecast innovation, basically um, the, the, um, the forecast projected onto the so that gives you a correction, and you add this to the previous forecast to get an analysis. And then you can start your forecast. So in a nutshell, uh, I know it's very simplified here in the way I pr present it, but that's basically giving you an idea how the um, key elements of the Kalman filter are working. Um, now, the other one, uh, let's now move on to the next one, is based on the base on Bayes theorem. Uh, which is about, uh, well, basically probability, um, uh, probabilities of an event based on previous or prior knowledge um, of, uh, of elements which in influence a particular event. And you can then do some kind of optimality analysis and you end up with a, a cost function, um, which in this case uh, has three elements. Uh, there's a cost function uh, for the model itself uh, and this is uh, the, the system noise, by the way, so allowing for some error in the model and the dynamics. Um, typically, and, and uh, you have then an option uh, to optimize the initial conditions uh, of a forecast or model run. So that's, that's <coughs> basically shown here uh, in the second term. And the last one, uh, which is the most common and most important one, perhaps, uh, is um, the, the model data misfit, which is shown here. So, and what you want to achieve in uh, 4D var, for instance, uh, is to uh, minimize the cost function. 
because then you can say uh, you've minimized the model error, you've minimized the, uh, the error in the initial conditions, and you've minimized uh, the error in the um, observations. Oh, sorry, in the model with regards to the observations. Um, now, the famous, um, famous methodology here, which of course has been adopted uh, by, um, at least in, in, in state estimation and uh, in, in, in some reanalyses, is, to, is the adjoint method. Uh, the adjoint me method basically gives you, uh, this is the, the model, basically your model, and if you take the transpose and then calculate backwards is the, the forcing uh, basically at time plus one, and you calculate backwards and calculate at time uh, i, plus the forcing, which is the model data misfit. That gives you the, the Lagrangian um, variable. And if you basically then um, use and calculate it backwards to the initial condition, uh, you then can use a, a certain gradient method or whatsoever to determine the minimum of the cost function. That's basically uh, the idea behind the, um, the adjoint model. And what you're doing here, in essence, is you integrate forward and you get a certain difference between the model values, say, and the observations. Uh, then you integrate adjoint model backwards, which gives you the gradient which tells you in which direction to change the initial conditions or whatsoever to re further reduce the cost function. And you only stop if the norm of your gradient and the cost function um, is less than a certain epsilon, which you have to determine. Uh, you then uh, compute, if it's not yet at the minimum or within epsilon, uh, you uh, compute the descent uh, direction, and there are lots of uh, options, Newton, conjugate gradient, etc. And then you uh, the step size by which the step, how, how big the step is in, in the direction to minimize the cost function. And then you basically uh, get an update and you update, for instance, the initial condition. Graphically, this looks like this. You start off with a certain cost function and then you go in a certain way. And there are lots of ways to, well, deal with it. Uh, and you eventually end up with a minimum cost function, which then gives you an optimized uh, initial condition or boundary condition, whatever you want to uh, whatever you are interested in, in terms of optimizing. Now, that's that. Um, just as a final slide on, on data simulation, or second slide, second last slide, uh, you typically start off with a nonlinear model. You then create, and you will have linear model for cost efficiency and uh, basically also uh, to make it easier to find a minimum. Um, you then have your adjoint model, calculate the conjugate and, and a new value of the cost function. If it's already in the minimum, which you defined earlier with three epsilon, uh, then you stop. Otherwise, you repeat this with new and improved initial conditions or boundary conditions. And eventually, you get an optimized set of um, control variables. Um, and basically, that then allows you to use your uh, nonlinear model again, uh, for instance, in forecast mode or uh, any kind of reanalysis mode. So again, in a nutshell, this is how um, the... Uh, 4D var in these days works. To summarize uh, the data simulation component, there's a minimum variance estimator theory which uh, applies to optimal interpolation Kalman filter. Uh, there's a maximum likelihood estimator uh, which uh, applies to the variational methods, uh, particularly oh, it's based on the Bayes theorem, uh, plus other approaches which I haven't described here, but they are largely, not exclusively, uh, variants of above. I think it's important to state that when the statistics of um, is, is multivariate Gaussian, uh, many of these approaches uh, collapse to the same basic formula and should theoretically at least uh, give very similar or identical uh, results. Okay, so that was a quick run um, through data simulation. Um, now, looking at a couple of um, um, applications, let me call it, in assigned or uh, modes of uh, operation, perhaps is the better word. Um, the first one is now cast, and I'll be quite brief with that one. Uh, now cars are still um, of interest to some of us. Uh, this is an application uh, by one of our colleagues um, in, in Hobart. Uh, basically, uh, what, what they are doing and what he is doing is uh, using remotely sensed data, altimetry, and um, it's hard to see uh, while I'm standing in front of it. Um, one is temperature, and I think the white lines uh, is altim alt altimetric sea level, if I get it right. And basically, by applying geography, uh, near the surface, uh, you then basically can also uh, derive um, the surface velocity uh, from, from altimetry. Um, so that's basically not a forecast. It's a very simple, nevertheless still useful picture of the present or 
close to present, near real time uh, situation of the surface ocean, uh, provided that uh, you have, uh, in this case, a telemetry and as background information, uh, also temperature. So that's still very useful information to some applications in, in uh, operational oceanography. Um, this is just one example. I think there are global examples as well. Uh, this one here is from the uh, NCEP GODA system, the analysis, uh, the analysis, and the analysis, of course, is basically um, uh, up to, to real time. It's not a forecast, uh, just another example. And okay, now, um, the next one, uh, Heinkas and reanalyses. Um, that's an interesting one as well, uh, because, as I said, Heinkast and reanalyses provide the best estimate, typically, uh, in terms of their description of past states. Um, so, and the reason, one reason being, because you can actually use uh, not just the, the, the time window being uh, double-sided, but also uh, 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 double-sided uh, re with respect to the, to the time you are at, but also because the observations usually have been uh, much better quality controlled. If you are operating in near real time in a forecasting system, you don't have the time to spend a week or so on, on uh, quality control, any observations you might have. Whereas, you know, if you do reanalysis and, you know, if you allow it just to go, say, within one month of, of present time, uh, in most cases you get much better data. So the error in the observations is typically much lower than in a, in a real time uh, ocean forecasting system. So with those two uh, reasons in mind, um, these reanalysis uh, present really what normally is the best possible scenario um, for a uh, forecasting system. But on top of that, they also um, offer us, as scientists, I think, a great potential uh, to do science. I mean, yes, some of us really are uh, working on the forecasting side of things. But on the other hand, and I show you a few examples uh, before I close this uh, lecture, um, they also basically uh, give us huge opportunities to better understand the ocean. Uh, and in, in a way which is almost certainly uh, guaranteed to be in closer agreement with the observations um, compared to um, non-data assimilating models. Um, before I do that, uh, as I said earlier, I just wanted to um, make a few comments, and I deliberately decided to put it here under reanalysis, um, a few more comments about um, biological or biogeochemical, I should say, uh, data assimilation. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are lots of efforts going on uh, in terms of uh, expanding the uh, ocean forecasting efforts, operational oceanography, into the biogeochemical domain. Um, Michel Reneker in 2010, so uh, seven years ago, uh, stated that uh, these uh, systems can be expected to be mature. Um, I'm frankly speaking, and this again my personal comment, I'm not sure that's fair to say that we've uh, reached that level, but uh, certainly there have been many more, uh, uh, much progress has been made in the last few years. Part of the problem is A, um, that compared to physical oceanography, um, there are typically less observations, and you need many more observations, if at all, uh, if you want to really compete in terms of skill and forecast um, um, reliability, uh, given the complexity of biogeochemical systems. But also, and this is just a list which I won't read out to you, uh, this gives you an idea of some, and certainly not all, of the parameters you need to know and or determine through data assimilation. Uh, in the biogeochemical domain. So raising, uh, uh, ranging from phytoplankton parameters to zooplankton, you name it. So that's different. I mean, and despite the fact that uh, we are facing uncertainty uh, in the physical domain about, uh, let's call it mixing parameters or whatsoever, uh, but I think it is fair to say that the challenges uh, on the biogeochemical side are much, much larger. Um, and so if you combine that then with a limited uh, set of observations compared to the um, physical domain, that explains partly why there has been not as much progress and why at this point in time uh, you won't see uh, too many um, absolutely reliable uh, biogeochemical forecasts. Some forecasting centers are trying those uh, uh, biogeochemical forecasts, but I think it's fair to say they're not yet up to scratch and comparable to the skills of um, physical forecasting. Um, and the, I think what I just said is just captured here uh, in the few dot points. Ah, the other point, of course, is um, critical, uh, very critical for uh, the biogeochemical forecasting, um, the, the three-dimensional uh, aspect of uh, the advection, in particular the vertical one, 
uh, and you can easily introduce uh, orders of magnitude errors in biogeochemical models uh, by um, slightly wrong uh, vertical velocities, which of course many of today's uh, physical models are uh, the divergence uh, of, of the horizontal velocity field. So there are still problems which relate to the linking, uh, the physics with the biology, uh, but perhaps uh, those of you who will talk about biogeochemical forecasting later in the summer school uh, can provide us with an update. Okay, um, I think um, I give you I give it another five minutes or so, and then I open the floor for questions. Uh, just a few um, examples of how we can use ocean reanalysis uh, in the context of research, or uh, more specifically, perhaps even in climate research. Um, and again, this is just giving you some ideas. I'm not saying that this is uh, basically all you can do with it. Um, number one. Uh, or I should mention, first of all, when I talk about reanalyses, uh, there's a wide variety of products available. Uh, many of you might have heard soda about soda. We saw earlier this morning, I think, echo um, results. And there are many others. Um, so this is just an idea from uh, or some, some um, results from our own work uh, where we looked at onshore, offshore changes to give you an idea what uh, data simulation can do. Uh, so these are uh, basically temperature uh, I, well, this and data simulation can really live welling regions and the, uh, the nature of isotherms and therefore uh, also the circulation. Uh, the multivariate uh, aspect of many data simulation schemes is nicely illustrated in this figure here. When you assimilate sea level anomaly alone, and this is a top a view of the region, and this is the vertical one, uh, you can see you get this kind of uh, eddy uh, signature in here. When you just do SST assimilation, you get a surf, as you would expect. Uh, due to decorrelation scale, you get a clear surface uh, signature. Uh, and then basically when you combine them, uh, you get this nice um, cap here at the surface in terms of temperature, which is exactly uh, what has been uh, how it has been observed. So it's really important that whenever we talk about observations, um, one observational data set alone doesn't do it. And that's what I said earlier. Uh, it's really the combination of altimetry and in situ observations, which gives the physical ocean forecasting its strength. Um, this is just another example of uh, time series and an investigation of uh, eddy, nature, eddy structures uh, of the East Australian current. Um, and um, what you can do with these kind of um, results from a reanalysis, because they are so close also to reality, um, you can actually look then uh, not just at statistical parameters, uh, how well, for instance, or how many eddies uh, you can find in a certain region, but you can also look at some physical uh, structures and then compare it again uh, to observations. Very similar to what, by the way, in terms of these uh, lean, zonal lean and meridional lean, what you uh, observe in, in tornadoes. Um, so uh, this is work uh, done by my colleagues a few years ago, but uh, very nice work, which again, you can do in standalone models, but you wouldn't get the degree of realism, uh, particularly if you want to focus on, um, how should I say, results which are in close agreement with observations. Um, I mentioned a minute ago upwelling regions. This is a uh, picture uh, of an upwelling region, uh, ABHR picture of the southeast Australian coast, Bonnet Coast, as we call it. Um, and from a reanalysis, from a global reanalysis, you hardly get any, any result. Uh, but if you then do this uh, with a uh, regional model with data simulation, um, certainly the, the results significantly improved. Uh, I think this is a clear vote for those of you who are in, in coastal modeling. Uh, global models, given that they typically have coastal resolution still, um, then coastal models can't do everything, and we still need uh, to rely on, on nested um, high-resolution models. Um, this is work uh, I did a while ago uh, with colleagues uh, where I looked actually at anomalous SST events in the Coral Sea. Um, I won't go into the details here, but you can actually uh, look very closely uh, and try to identify reasons for uh, coral bleaching based on, on physical parameters and how, and that's also important, and how they basically uh, add up in terms of horizontal and vertical uh, advective and surface heat fluxes in a, in a certain region. Uh, which we identified to be the box over there. So again, this assists in understanding and better understanding the physical nature of, of uh, events associated with coral bleaching. Um, and um, perhaps the final uh, slide set from our side here, uh, we also did some analysis of the very important intraseasonal variability in the Indian Ocean. Uh, there's, a clear there's clear evidence that wind stresses in the equatorial eastern Indian Ocean 
um, have an important impact on Kelvin valve propagation and eventually Rossby wave propagation in the Eastern Indian Ocean, uh, which is typically uh, along this uh, path or ray path uh, south of Indonesia and then along the Australian Northwest Shelf. Uh, without going to the details here, but the model, uh, the data assimilating model, typically reproduce the results very well. Uh, you can actually see uh, propagating uh, Kelvin valves as, they, as the signal uh, basically uh, progresses in time. So these are different time windows after uh, 25 and 30 days or so. Uh, and you can also see the, the propagation and uh, basically the separation eventually of uh, Rossby wave into the Indian Ocean. Now, the other reason why I'm showing that is because it also helps you um, to identify and compare then events which have been observed in the uh, very important uh, Indonesian region, uh, where you both can see in, in the model's uh, temperature anomalies as well as in the uh, uh, zonal velocity anomalies. And this is time zero, day zero, and this is minus the event in the, um, in the central Indian Ocean, and this is 30 days plus the event in the Indian Ocean. You really see that the model and uh, really reproduces the observations. Um, and this is true uh, for uh, the events in the temperature, but also in the velocity. You actually have signals penetrating from the Indian Ocean into the Indonesian through flow, which is contrary to what many people think. They always think, oh, well, there's just something coming through uh, from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. But there are events like these intraseasonal variability events where you clearly see um, signals penetrating the other way. So, uh, okay, this is uh, work done by Wunsch and Heimbach uh, on a more uh, larger scale, I think, in terms of the overturning circulation based on um, the work uh, with, echo, uh, with the ECHO model. Um, without going into details here, they looked, uh, it's a quite early work as well, uh, at the strengthening and or weakening of various layers in the overturning circulation. So clearly looking at, at climate impacts in the, uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, and then if you, and I didn't mention it, uh, basically, if you take um, a certain approach with regards to the variational um, um, data simulation, the um, adjoint, you actually can, because it's going backwards in time, uh, as I said earlier, you can actually calculate sensitivities and you can ask the question, well, okay, I've got an anomaly, say, in the Eastern Pacific uh, at time um, X, year, year, at a certain year. Where does this anomaly come from? And the adjoint is a very um, nice way uh, to tell you, if you apply it in the right way, where the sources of a certain signal that appear in, say, 2005, where that signal came from uh, in year 2000, as an example. And in this case, uh, it came basically from the subduction reason, a simple example uh, of the North and the South Pacific. So that's another very nice tool, uh, which has also been used uh, to look at, by the way, uh, heat flux variations in the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, very final set of slides here. Um, it's all about, in terms of uh, data assimilation, of course, we have to know not just uh, certain error information, uh, as I said, background error covariance matrices, matrices um, observing uh, uh, errors, etc. But uh, basically, it's also very challenging because of the need to know information about the uncertainty in models, in the surface forcing, but then, of course, uh, no data assimilation system is perfect. Uh, these models, sorry, these errors can all add up. So how then to balance it is, and that is really the real science in data assimilation, uh, because the weighting you give to certain errors or the previous the knowledge you have will inevitably uh, influence the skill of your, let it be reanalysis or even your forecast system. Um, a nice example here uh, I want to show you here is uh, actually done, uh, was done uh, in the context of uh, the ocean heat constant. And... Um, Again, without going too much detail, this green line is from the, from the GECO model, uh, assimilating model, and it showed a deviation in terms of the ocean heat content from all the other models, including the observations. So initially, um, the authors um, thought, you know, there must be a, a problem with the model because something is wrong. Uh, as it turned out, uh, during the 1970s, there was an, a problem with the um, fall rate um, of the XPT data which were the major database in those days. Um, and what happened in the Gecko model, because it used a 4D system which also tried to optimize the surface conditions, surface flux conditions, uh, that would have required not just a change in the, in the model's initial conditions or the interior values, let's call it that way, uh, but also in the surface boundary conditions. And that didn't, wasn't allowed by the weighting 
given uh, and the errors assigned to the surface fluxes. And so the model basically said, there's something wrong here. I can't get it in agreement with the so-called observations. Uh, once that, was, uh, that the um, problem was fixed with the uh, XPT data and the fall rate, um, the other models fell in line and produced the same result. So that gives you an idea where we actually occasionally can learn uh, from models telling us something, uh, data simulating model, models, uh, that is, and, uh, and they can tell us, you know, that something is wrong. Uh, it can tricky business, as, you have, as I said before, you have to look at the right things, it's often not straightforward, but in this case it had really helped to identify a problem in the observations. Okay, um, summarizing and then opening the floor for questions, uh, and this is I think my only summary slide. Um, I think uh, the take-home message uh, from, from, from this first lecture this morning is really for you to be aware of the overall complexity of operational oceanography, which is the combination of observations and, and in terms of forecasting, real-time observations, uh, quality control, which has to happen automatically if you're really uh, uh, in the business of uh, ocean forecasting. Key element is data simulation, but also, as I said before, the quality of the model. Um, so data simulation can always uh, correct model, but it, they, it can't really overcome a, let me call it in quotes here, a bad model. So you, your model should already do a reasonable job before you actually start assimilating observations. And then, of course, in the context of operational centers, issues of data management and product and service delivery are also important. And I stop here. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Any serious questions go to my co-lecturers. <laughs>